Thank you for coming. Welcome to Cezic. Welcome to Florin uh, from One Plus One and Livia, who's watching us. Uh, this is our last event in the Our Theory sessions, which this year uh, was organized with me, by me and Anka. This one is uh, specifically organized by Florin and Livia, and uh, it's part of their project Inconvenient Path. Um, and it will be a presentation of Rabra Press in Helsinki. Um, and uh, I think uh, we can do, it will be a short presentation, I mean a presentation, and then uh, we can do some questions yeah. uh, and a talk. Right? Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So hello everyone. My name is Sezgin Boynik. I'm based in Helsinki. And um, I'm here invited by uh, Florin Bobu and Livia Pansu, whom I met in Iashi last year when they had a series of lectures on nationalism. <coughs> and uh, I co-edited a book 10 years ago called Contemporary Art and Nationalism, Critical Reader. It's a publication which uh, deals with the question how much contemporary art is art that ideological structure that reproduce nationalism. I would not necessarily say produce, but reproduce by, by the means which are more sophisticated than banal nationalism. So this is how I met with Florin and Livia. And then uh, I have to tell this, how it came that I do this lecture here. And then uh, I uh, introduced Harun Faroki's film that he did with uh, Ujika. Uh, in 1992 called Videograms of Revolution because Faroki is one of uh, uh, filmmakers and artists that really is important for, how, for my project, which I understand to be political formalism or politics of form, generally on political art, political experimental art, if you want. So after we watched that film, we had a very entangled, very complicated discussion about the limits of a representation of that film, which is about the Romanian revolution, and how much, in fact, art, which is quite progressive, as it is, Faroki's art and film, has certain limits when it comes to, the, to represent the historical events. So we there came in the very strong discussion on what are, in fact, potential of experimental art to involve with the political issues, what can contribute, what are shortcomings of that. And we are now following the, the project. So I was here, <laughs> like, I hear my voice. Uh, I was here in, in, uh, in, in August. We uh, watched that film, discussed again, and widened up that question of Faroki's forms and politics representation. And uh, in week on weekend, on Saturday, I will have a lecture at, in Yashi at uh, Transit, their place, about this question, about like what is how politics informed. Farok is filmmaking already from the late 60s, precisely from 67 onwards, and how that experimental essay filmmaking looked at a concrete political issue, let, let's say a real political issue, not like some political concept. But uh, this is, I would say, a, one segment of my research and the one uh, uh, outcome of this research that I do, sometimes are books, articles, lectures, is a publishing project uh, based in Helsinki called Rab Rab. So uh, Rab Rab is what you see here is a cover of the first issue of a journal that uh, we initiated, few of us, 
in Helsinki in 2014 to address that complicated questions of political art. And uh, our starting point is very simple. We will, we in discussion, go into deep, deep, more, let's say, abstract questions of form and politics, their relationship. But now my aim is just to present what we did in four years, okay? So this is the first issue. And uh, the statement that we wrote in, pardon, in the introduction uh, is starting with a, a quip from Alain Badiou saying the only lesson from which there is no returning back is the lesson of antagonism. Which we, <laughs> I have some virus you know, all the time, it will, this will come. Uh, the, this, uh, by this we, we mean that when contradictions are taken to the extreme limits, what we have with this question of form and politics, then it is the, the issue of compromise of or being in the art world that is maintained with institution is rather difficult. So we kind of in our project support more the what initially early avant-garde from the beginning of 20th century promised, which is the art project as like uh, learning through contradictions. So without letting let contradictions to pass or simplifying them, and even further com making them more complex or adding some other perspectives than usual what is understood as a political art. So we, for example, uh, don't understand political art as just an art which can even affect. For us, is art not an NGO style uh, completing the project. So we are, we are a bit like keeping distance toward the utilitarian understanding of art because there are other cultural fields, other cultural organizations that do that better. <laughs> so what is that art can do which other cultural organizations and institutions cannot do or other logics cannot do is more or less the, the fundamental question of this project. <coughs> and in that sense, it comes to the thesis, we arrive to thesis, that these are forms. Art maintains its practice, artistic thought, artistic idea are in the end based on some formal configuration, some formal understanding of the, of these contradictions that I mentioned. This is the first issue. I, I read briefly what was the content and I enlarge. So this is the content of the first issue. The first text was by John Roberts. He wrote a few texts, a few books that are published by Verso. And uh, most known is uh, art as a deskilling, deskilling art, you know. He, he is of art theoreticians who take the work of conceptual art made in 60s and 70s to the logical, to the to the very end, to the, uh, to the logical conclusion of what conceptual art promised. And it is not only making art out of paper, making art with text. Conceptualism in 60s and 70s meant something more than that. And what is that is John Roberts wrote plenty uh, books and articles about that question. He is, among others, influenced by Adorno, and this radical autonomy of the, of the artistic production and discovering in that urge of the autonomy the very political core of the art. Of course, this is familiar to all of you who are involved in avant-garde or discussions with conceptual art. In this text that he wrote for uh, Rab Rab here is he talks, what does it mean when artist writes? What, is, what does it mean artist text? And this question, he 
pushes to or to maybe to until 18th century you can already see from the subtitle building and the intellectual division of labor but what is the more more interesting for us here in the direct understanding of that that question writerly artist writing of artists is not the practice of of let's say any other practice like artists either take a photo or artists make installation or artists write no right the writing in artists according to him means changing the very function of what we understand the knowledge production here what he defends he doesn't mention but what for for me personally and for many other contributors in rub rub is important is artists has to start from what they know and what they know the best is what they do which is the artwork it's the, the example that i like to do give usually is kazimir malevich for example when he prior to painting the black square in december 1915 he have an written anything he start to write because he arrived with his artistic work with his artistic practice artistic experimentation to the i would say to uh, some level that outcome was the non-objective art as we know like non-representation art which is this Let's start. So to explain where did he arrive, he started to write. Writing process is that. That simplify, maybe, to give some with these examples. So uh, most of the contributors in Rab Rab are by artists. So writers are artists. Artists write. Uh, we don't have text by curators. Uh, we don't have text by art criticism, and we don't have art criticism in our journal so far we haven't published because art criticism to understanding that we defend is a mediation uh, usually between institutions and the practice so we believe that the real richness of what is intellectual or discursive in art is in very practice not in outside as it is affects visible in institutions or there are scholars writing or researchers but writing about the process that they can reflect of what happened to them the transformative process in involving with art project not theoreticians now as an expert to explain what art is it's not that philosophical theoretical patronage definitely not it's like the theory has changed theory became uh, theory became something else else in that practice of course it's difficult to achieve this and that's why we publish once a year because I, I mean you are involved in I guess similar questions R writing artistic practice uh, confronting with limits of representations institutional demands are very difficult but nevertheless a concrete pro problems which exist and then we have uh, so we have special issues we try to have the first issue is about language or generally about s codes slogans signals language like how because that had to be since everything is about writing and where where we operate in helsinki there is the art scene very much influenced by heideggerian position that places art practice or art into phenomenological realm that goes beyond the language transcends the language which defends the artistic practice or artistic whatever happens around the art as something outside of a language that cannot be explained with existing means i mean of course art has this distinctiveness singularity whatever but we live in this world that we communicate with language and we have to have we have to apply that radical materialist i would say secular idea secularist idea also to art 
no matter how singular it is the production and the practice. So other examples are uh, scholar from Finland made the uh, interesting uh, theater based on Capital, Karl Marx Capital. Then we have a text by uh, Susan Kelly. She's from, based in London. She's teaching uh, in Goldsmiths. It is a chapter of her PhD about a grammar, grammar of uh, uh, Lenin's writings. This is the latest project actually we did. I will tell about that in the end. Then I had an art project on how we can index Lenin how we can talk about Lenin without falling into that narrative of, of the, of, I would say, the reactionary or right-wing historians or, or anti-communist discourse. Because as you know, Lenin was also influential for many avant-garde poets, not only Russian, but also European and larger. Middle East, Latin American, and filmmakers and theoreticians. So from Rancière, Badiou, Althusser, Zizek, okay, to Marevich, uh, many surrealists, Breton, to filmmakers like Godard and all these things. Okay, so how to make sense of let Lenin was my question, and I did some, some project on that. Then there is, a, maybe you are familiar with Alexei Yurchak, who is an anthropologist who wrote uh, one of the most interesting book about post-Soviet, but after post-Stalin, I would say, everyday life, called, very interesting title, Everything Was Forever Until It Stopped Exist. It is a book by Alexei Yurchak. Now was a, it took from him. So uh, I ask Alexei to, to put the core, because what is not known usually is like uh, this book is published by Berkeley or Princeton, Uni pardon, Princeton University Press. It's academic book. But at the core of his interest was an artistic question that he discovered how after Stalin's death in Soviet Union, the political, I would say, institutions were dealing with the contingent situations. What means that? Like unexpected situations. Because Stalin had answer for everything, but he's dead. So ideology is in a vacuum. And they build a complicated citational system. Something similar to what art and language and other conceptual artists were doing that you, you have uh, something on meteorology, something climates, and there are experts who would find what Lenin said about sunny day, or what Stalin said about earthquake, or whatever, because you had to have these epigrams, you know? And it's with that complicated meta quotational ideological discourse, narrative, is in fact artistic something there and I asked Alexei to write only about that and he wrote a few pages. By the way, this book, this issue and other issues are available in our website as a PDF. Then uh, there are, there is uh, artist I can show also like this. No. On full page, yeah. I go to because there are some images that would be nice to show <coughs> like how art Susan Kelly's text on on Lenin's grammar. Okay, uh, this is about Lenin. Then Alexei Yurchak, only three pages. Then here is a text by a Finnish artist, Mina Henriksson. She studied why in Finland swastika is still in use. By the way, it is. And the usual disclaimer of the Nazi connection is that 
this is based on like some cult, you know, like in India they use swastika and they are connecting to Celtic, some old Nordic or whatever, like some invented lineage. And she actually looked at a very historical moment of when swastika entered to the popular use and to the political use. And there is a very, what we say, a suspicious connections with the Nazi Germany. For example, the Civil War 1980, Civil War 1918, the plane which bombed Reds. Do you know that in Finland was a civil war? Immediately after the independence, the uh, people, peasants and workers, some peasants and many workers were against the white government. So they started this ideological civil war and then uh, whites had the planes, they intervened to red, bombed the reds, whites win, won, uh, but they had swastika. So it's like, ah, because they saw in plain swastika, 1918, but the swastika was a donation of an aristocrat guy from the Sweden whose sister was married to Goebbels. Or Göring, I don't know, some of them. <laughs> Göring or Goebbels, I don't know. Which one was the war minister? Göring. Yeah, Goebbels was the ministry of the propaganda. So here is the plane, okay? And then made the more research on how, in fact, the institutions has this maintain their right wing white dominant ideology through the decades throughout the 20th century by disclaiming the direct connection between the Nazis which there is so it was one of the work then there is a work dealing with like a historical past memory by a two artists living in Helsinki David Moores and Giovanna Esposito and Diego Bruno filmmaker who also deals with like a experimental filmmaker deals with like a question of past question of history then maybe you know artists based in Belgrade Rena Radlen Vladan Jeremic they uh, is a cartoon story about how uh, Roma people are more or less exploited as if it is a colonialist times in Italy and how that paperless Roma are entering into this capitalist exploitation with collaboration of mafia and state. Okay, this nowadays known fact can yeah. it's like and then there is a theoretician Galkian and Nilufer Tajeri who made like a, a work of how would look a book, how would look a pardon exhibition if he expand David Harvey's the post uh, condition of postmodernism into the gallery. Because it, the book is about how our understanding of space and times change with postmodernism. Manuela Unver Dorben is artist based in Munich. She uh, built a narrative based on the CIA declassified documents on Yugoslavia. And her, of course, argument is that CIA already was writing these documents as sort of fantasy. You don't need to add any other extra fantasy. You know, like, it's always this kind of whether these political constructions, representations, how much it is fantastical based on phantasm. And Gregoire Rousseau into chess and this idea of that language. This is interesting piece. It is uh, by an experimental musician, Shinji Kanki, who discovered a mistake in Stockhausen's composition, mathematical, like he, uh, in, in one of her early Stockhausen composition made in 50s, to the second, he discovered that the calculation, the arithmetic Stockhausen used, because you know how he composed, it was very sort of anti-humanist, machinic understanding of creativity. And then he wrote a foundation which refused to acknowledge, but later on they accept. 
but that means not uh, some nerd discovering some numbers wrong. It is he, what he discovered, which unfortunately we made interview with Gregoire Rousseau, with Shinji, was how interpretations of Stockhausen today, contemporary interpretations, uh, disregard the noise, the, the unpredictability aspect of Stockhausen, which was very important. This aleatoriness, noise, you know, like even everything looks very mathematical. For him, that was quite performative. But interview, we by mistake erased. So only his mathematical, <laughs> mathematical formula we published. <laughs> then the another text is uh, by Michel Chevalier, who was then based in Hamburg, and who runs an uh, interesting space and a journal dedicated on, on music. We published also in other issues, in following issue, another text of him. But this one, he is analyzing a relationship between punk, especially the no wave, which was, I don't know if you are familiar, like with bands like DNA, Mars, Lydia Lunch. So they, 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 the context that they were working on was actually very much uh, in parallel, in relation with a uh, conceptual art that has politicized by mid 70s. So this is a New York scene. Interesting thesis here. I recommend this text especially. And of course, the limits what is understood by the a punk being a mere, mere like a commodity musical form, but just like punk also had ideas which goes beyond that subculture, beyond that subculture understood just as a entertainment. It was that, but not only that. And let's say the cerebral motives, not only a body substratum. You understand like this Dan Graham video artist has a, has a video about punk called Rock My Religion. Did any of you watch this film? It's in YouTube or in Ubu somewhere, but I really recommend, very interesting. But his idea, even his conceptual artist, his idea is that punk is uh, a, a bodily sort of emergence, which goes to the archetypes of some very heterodox religion sects. You know this theory? There are Gary Marcus's book on punk and situationist lipstick. lipstick traces is also having that like heretic punk. Okay. So he puts another, he puts cerebral intellectual sphere, which is good. <laughs> and then uh, it's a text which caused quite a stir in Helsinki, but other places would not, I guess. Uh, he's an artist who, who does painting also, but his PhD is on Adorno. He did it as an artistic PhD. And he understood how today what it became as a as a institution in in its on its own, what is called artistic research. I don't know how much is that in Romania now in there are master degrees, PhD degrees, but all around the world and it became like huge sort of literature, artistic research. And uh, he looked at how in uh, Art Academy of Helsinki, those who are doing a PhD on artistic research, understand what research is. His critique is very harsh. His criticism, he claims that artists think whatever they do is artistic research. Even if they make yoga, because they are artists, that is the research. And he criticized that sort of spiritualist, metaphysical understanding of artistic research. Because that's why for, for me, it was very important that we have this text, is that artistic research that avoids contradictions cannot be called research, cannot be called, first of all, artistic. 
So yeah, this was the text. He schematized those his uh, uh, discoveries, and then we made the special issue. Here is on uh, then 2015 we published Rub Rub as a two volumes. First and second issue unfortunately sold out, but we have PDF. And the uh, second issue is about noise. That's the topic. And it's in two volumes. Uh, the introduction that I wrote, I tried to understand or, or discuss noise not only a disturbing factor because to let's say to get rid of this evolutionist historicist teleological understanding of noise which is what is yesterday's noise is today's sound like what was yesterday's unbearable today is very pleasant can be pleasant like when Elvis Priestley came was noise uh, establishment uh, attacking him. Then came uh, Beatles, more noise. Then came garage rock. Then came punk, hardcore, whatever, you know. But that's evolutionist understanding is actually wrong. The noise has something substantially, let's say, unmanageable. Something like you cannot easily reduce to signal. Is, or let's say, question was, is there such a noise that we cannot make, if we cannot make it signal? You know, signal is usually understand as the opposite to noise. That's why it's called noise against culture. That's something which goes completely on the level that culture cannot assimilate it. Something that cannot be co-opted, recuperated, assimilated. That's. It. So let's call it that noise. That was the starting point. And of course, m many things are to do with, uh, with uh, 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 music or noise. <laughs> uh, interview I did with Dror Failer. Does anybody of you know this musician Dror Failer? Uh, who make uh, also noise albums with Lasse Merhaug, based in Stockholm. He's a saxophone player, uh, originally from Israel, and uh, he became uh, world known. He had this 15 minute when ambassador of Israel to St Stockholm, to Sweden, vandalized his artwork in Historiska Museum, in the Museum of History in Stockholm, because he is from Israel, but coming from a very political family. His uh, mother is active, he's old, mother is 90 years, but is, she's living in Gaza, and she's representing uh, Pharmacists Sans Frontier. No Pharmacists Sans Frontier, no, uh, one, another organization uh, working with Palestinians. Uh, father was a uh, founder of the Israeli Communist Party. He himself is a spokesman to ship to Gaza. And he made a peace installation where he put a, a picture of suicide bomber of one woman and uh, music of Bach and you know art installation about violence let's say good or bad as an artist I don't think he is particularly interesting but as a musician he is and uh, Israeli ambassador was in the opening he smashed it was every uh, news wrote about that maybe that was 2009 8 literally he took uh, uh, speakers hit with a fit destroyed in artwork in 21st century and uh, so I this interview is not about that interview is about his noise his music he makes free jazz he has uh, he played in the bands like a uh, locomotive concrete too much, too soon. Well, quite, in, you can check him. There is plenty of stuff he puts online. And some his writings on, on noise, on politics of noise, actually. Then there is a thing about Mazen Kerbaj, who is a, 
Okay, I can because there is not so much images. I can show like this. Mazen Kerbash is a filmmaker, uh, pardon, uh, artist and musician based in Beirut, and he made one exceptionally interesting, I would say, anthological uh, song called "The Starry Night." He recorded it in in summer 2006 when Israel was bombing uh, Lebanon. And uh, he went to his balcony and he's an improvised musician. He played prepared trumpet, so it is aleatory. It's, you cannot play as you wish because it's destroyed the thing. And uh, the drums were the Ministry of Defense of Israel because they were bombing that bombs. It's really one of the most eerie, spooky song, political song, I can tell, because that's the big state violence coming to a city, a bombs, and it's contingent. You don't know when, how they explode, and they are like percussion. And he improvised on them. Seven minutes. We have a comment by Ozrem Pupovac, who is not about that work, but shows how state what is the relationship between state, violence, art? And it's called the violence of form. Then Ben Watson, who is one of the persons who was, not anymore, because he quit after this text of The Wire magazine. Uh, he wrote after 9-11 bombings, uh, something about like how many writers on 9-11 interpreted violence and, and hardcore music and noise music. Then there are some other texts on, just I go quick, there is a Michel Chevalier again. He chose another target, one target to this time, which is called, whose name is Dietrich, Dietrich Sen, and how he as a curator and art critic writes about underground music. And his thesis is that curators and art critics, when they write about underground music, actually they write as if they write about art, which is never underground. It's always mainstream, maintained by the big institutions. So the logic of the art about writings about music in art is very limited. And he goes to some very detailed studies on that. Then a uh, few things on Rousseau, in fact, critique of Luigi Rousseau, the futurist noisemaker, and, um, and uh, how that one text here claims that there is too much noise, too much stories about Rousseau. In fact, his understanding of noise it was a qu quite conservative. So, which is easily then to link his, with his another conservatism, that is fascism. He supported fascism, as many other Italian futurists. And then the second volume is not directly with the noise. There, are, there is interview with Darko Suvin, then the uh, section of, uh, which pre was prepared by Anthony Isles, the people who are involved in Mute magazine. So Anthony Ailes made a text with Martin. By the way, Anthony Ailes and Martin have a book which is called Noise and Capitalism. Very interesting book. I really recommend that. Uh, it's also PDF you can find. And then they write some text about Viktor Shklovsky, Russian formalist. Then there are a few other texts about Viktor Shklovsky some text about Sergei Tretyakov, and uh, one curious text about uh, Karl Marx Maledictor, it's called. It's uh, a, a text about Marx using swear words. You know, Marx used a lot of swear words when he was writing. And <laughs> it's like interesting text, swear words. And then there is like a interview which, which Milica Tomic did with another artist, another, pardon, art producer making 
artwork for a big artist in Belgrade and all his labor, third world, precarious, that discussion. Here also, what I'm really proud is that we made an interview with Peter Gidal. Are you familiar with the work of Peter Gidal? He is a filmmaker. He made uh, his, uh, what he calls himself, structuralist filmmaker, already from the late 60s, still today makes films, wrote a book called Materialist Film, published by Rotledge, uh, wrote Structural Film Anthology, uh, very uh, f filmmaker which defends complete detachments from the representational forms. So that you cannot recognize anything from this world in his films. But the thing is, he claims that to be a political. And he writes books about that. So prior to his visit to Helsinki, few of us from journal study his work and made extensive interview with him, especially how he was in, involved in studying Althusser and uh, how he was invo influenced, this strong filmmaking was influenced by feminism and, and that feminism which is coming from the writings of Christine Delphi. The time when we asked Christine to give he permission to reprint this text from 70s, she get, she replied to us that just a few days ago she uh, agreed with Verso that her and it came that book. It's called it, it is called Closer to Home: <coughs> Materialist Analysis of Woman Oppression. You can now buy, but uh, that time was just to be printed. It's very interesting text book. And here she claims that woman is so structurally oppressed in the society, like even divorce does not emancipate, does not divorce woman from that oppression. The patriarchal oppression continues even with a woman that is divorced, okay? This is to what today feminism is researching. Of course, this is not so radical, but this influenced artists filmmakers in a way they said well we say we will do experimental film we will not do mainstream film but still mainstream is so strong we cannot divorce and the difficulty to divorce from mainstream existing forms of narratives it's so difficult that the claim of these people that making experimental film is a militant position political position gets justification in there. Like, this is, let's say, the formal explanation. But other than that, filmmakers like Peter Gidal, Malcolm Legris, were also involved in the non-capitalist forms of distribution of their films and production. And the most important feminist filmmakers came out from this stream. These are a stream of filmmakers like Liz Rhodes, Annabel Nicholson, then the Birgit Hain and others, Joanna Millet, Nikki Hamlin, which today is seen as a precursor of what is the uh, moving image or the film in the gallery, in the art scene, you know, the film in the white box, black box. It is coming from that question. And they said, we don't want, we are women. We make films, but we don't want to make a films which are explicitly about female content. By that, they mean if experimental film is about what is the question of film. That is the repetition, temporality. That is what makes film a film. That what men can ask, but women are reduced to the question of body, to a question of affects, to the question of family, not to the big question of structure, philosophy, temporality, things like that. And these, there are plenty of them. They said, no, 
we're not going to make a feminist films with a recognizable female content. We will make universal films because we can think too. And these are really interesting films. This summer I organized a, a retrospective of these films. It was quite interesting because many are forgotten in a way. No. I can share if you are interested with that program just to check what are these films. Some you can find online today or you can download. And uh, then is, am I talking too fast? Is it very uh, too much things? If you, you can just interrupt something if you want to know more. So this is third issue. And third issue was about forest. We call it forest issue because it's particularly because in, in Finland there are a lot of arts entering to that Heideggerian questions through forest, like forest, nature, uh, through being, metaphysics. And then we wanted to do a critique of that, but then entering to a completely another one, I would say, a uh, window. And that is that Karl Marx first political text was written in 1842. This is the text that made him communist. Or let's say that's the narrative. When he analyzed how the uh, of stealing of the dead wood, the wood that is fallen from the tree, from the forest in pra Prussia, is discussed in the parliament, how it is made a legal case. And then he realized that a state, and with state, the legal system is not a natural, it's not a neutral to the subjects of the nation, okay? But that there is a violence inside, which means the ruling class is building, making the juridical system, the laws. Laws are not same for everyone. Even this is how we should know. Laws are, no, laws are not. Laws are protecting the private property, protecting the capitalism, the capitalist understanding of the exploitation and all these things. But the interesting point for me was that Marx disbanded another project while start to write this, which was a book about art that he was planning to write from that leftist Hegelian position. So understand this as a kind of metaphor. You have art, Hegelian, and you look at the concrete question of how certain crime is discussed, petty crime, I would say, little crime. The wood that is, it's not the cutting the trees, but that is fallen, that tree. And so entering to politics, what we have here, I, uh, introduction then, touching on many things and uh, and uh, so uh, general question here was, what is the status of abstraction? How did Marx abstract it? From the empirical what he sees, from let's say neutral, uh, neutrality of law, he abstract to some other, other conclusions to, toward violence, toward asymmetry and all these questions. So uh, red thread of the issue is abstraction how to abstract things. What is the status of, what is the potential of abstraction? And again, artists, uh, like already appeared in previous issues, Rena and Vladan, they made a very interesting work based on the Yugoslavian self-management time, how they, uh, in the iron construction factory, invited artists who work with the workers and made the abstract sculptures. So like abstraction 
also workers can abstract in their aesthetics is their message. Then the text by Darko Suvin, something also about the Marx. Do you know Bini Adamczak? Her book is translated. She's a very interesting feminist based in Berlin. And uh, she made a quite interesting joke about you know this Althusser's interpolation when police says hey and you turn and you are ideologically interpolated you are interpolated to ideology you are sub subjected you are subjectivized you know the theory of Althusser so how he gives the example and so she said like 13 ways how to avoid interpolation it's funny things you know <laughs> But then we published uh, uh, except from her book called Communism for Children was, but then it was translated Communism for Kids. Do you know this small book MIT published? Very, very funny book about how you can explain to children, to kids, what is exploitation, what is labor. And there are some ex excerpts. This is text on Arto and Arto's uh, psychedelic-infused anti-fascism, and uh, something about, uh, again, uh, Ben Watson with his graphic poems. I'm skipping now. I cannot tell everything. This is about uh, Rudolfo Walsh, uh, Argentinian militant writer, very interesting story. <coughs> Again, Gal Kiern about uh, riots and uh, how would Franz Fanon today explain them. Another art piece by Diego. Representation of, uh, because we had in the first issue. So you can see like these are many artistic texts also. Kerstin Schrodinger is a filmmaker. She makes films about colors. For example, she made a film about color red. And that kind of question, here is text about that. Uh, poetry. This is a text by the filmmaker who made the film about an other filmmaker from Yugoslavia, Ladislav Galeta, also very experimental making a mathematical structural understanding of or limits of creativity. This is rather interesting thing. I want to pause a bit. It is uh, by an uh, art theoretician, actually, Ketevan Kinturashvili. She's based in Tbilisi. And uh, she made a reenactment of David Kakabadze, who was a Georgian futurist, uh, a work. Uh, David Kakabadze was avant-garde. And then he went to Paris in 20s to escape Bolshevization of the Georgia. And there he studied, and he had this idea of, to have a stereoscopic cinema. So. 3D, some, he convinced some uh, business people, but didn't work out. It all was fiasco. But he was, uh, he was artist with some merit, so with uh, quite a merit. He participated in a big, big uh, exhibitions also. Then he returned to Georgia, denounced his formalist period, made the paintings, and then still he, he became then professor. It's a very tragic life. And, uh, but the, what they can call socialist realist, but most of the time these are unsuccessful, jealous provincial artists who attack avant-garde, you know that. Never actually party attacked avant-garde art. Like in the history of the Russian Russia also, in all socialist countries, never party has even once attacked 
experimental avant-garde art. It was always the conservative artist attacking, which is today happening also. If you do experimental art dealing with gender or who gonna attack is other artists who are saying, well, they are getting all these grants, of course, because they know how to write. They are getting all these exhibitions, of course, because they do good art, you know? And this was same thing in 20s and 30s, like party never targeted. It's all, all the time you can study from Malevich to Lisinski to Rodchenko to, to Czechos, Czech, uh, you can go to Karel Tege, Yugoslavia, whatever you want. Here, I don't know much. But who, initi who, who they can censor or they can have a word. I don't think it's so disconnected. Party is in the end who says, but party, you know, party, party all communist party is for democratic, uh, if it's the work against communism, of course they are against the principles of class, class war, no, against the... No. Please find me one example. When party directly target, it's usually other artists who make yeah, party to attack. It's not the party directly, but it's the party that supports the censorship committee, right? Sure, but yeah. party never initiates. Don't, don't uh, white the party, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we will go into the discussion, for sure, but uh, Let's not whitewash the party. Let's whitewash the workers' party, you know? And uh, what I want to say is that party had a lot of things, problems to deal with. There was, to my understanding, the parties, to my knowledge even, the party directly interfering to the artistic abstractions. I don't know that example. It is usually some letters to the party by the editors or, or other artists who complain that they are overpresented. But anyway, but maybe that's why I, I don't know Romania. Interesting. So, but what I know in some countries that I study, I don't know such an example. And David Kakabadze in order to survive of that attacks, he start to paint. Stalin, Lenin, still attack was harsher and harsher that he cannot get rid of formalism. And then he come up with an idea to make, uh, to use his invention from 20s, which is this three-dimensional stereoscopic representation, to make a painting of Stalin. That is like a, Look at this. <coughs> These are, uh, maybe, I don't know how can I make it a two page, but okay. So Stalin put in this, not this, but this. If you put a light to all of them, which are these, then this is how it worked the pieces. When you see it's very abstract, these abstract bits and pieces, then you will see that there is a Stalin. Stalin's three-dimensional big photo. Okay, you can recognize a bit here. But he got a real attack after this, that this was a blasphemy and he died of heart attack or something like that. I don't remember exactly. So like the, the last hope of making the monumental progressive portrait of Stalin also was like a dead end in Georgia. And so she, by reenacting that work, put into that question of power, avant-garde, party, and artistic experiments. So then there is interview with John Roberts, I mentioned, who wrote the first text in the first issue. And uh, uh, I made the work exhibition on hardcore punk. Uh, these are thesis on what <coughs> hardcore punk is. I take a picture, pictures from usual hardcore punk journals, 
that you see like they are leaning to the wall, brick wall. And it's very iconic. And there are some graffitis. I found a piece of the wall where you cannot see any reference, any text or whatever. And on top imposed thesis on hardcore. My idea is that hardcore is not a continuation of punk. It's, there is no evolutionist explain, explanation of hardcore. Hardcore came as almost with, from nowhere, emerged out of blue. To explain this charge with the Sex Pistols and others, or how Crass came, it's very anachronistic things there. Crass was more hippie than punk influenced, but they've been into hardcore scene. And what is the hardcore? How hardcore understand uh, things like violence, things like body, things like collective ritual. So the main thing is hardcore has its own form of intelligibility. It does understand things in its own terms. Maybe that's kind of hardcore is local, but at the same time genuinely international. If you listen hardcore, or if you listen sometime, you know that hardcore listeners are really fans that want to know everything what happened in the world. And they really are collectioners. It's there's something like that. Hardcore as such resists determination and causality. It is a break. Okay. And then a uh, translation of Igor Chubarov. Not yet in English, he wrote a very interesting book called uh, Communist Sensuality, or sometimes trans translated Sensibility, about uh, Russian futurists' political experiments. It is only in Russian, but we made a small excerpt from the, of the thesis from the book. And here is an artist from St. Petersburg who, which, who applied a gravity to suprematist recognizable artworks. <laughs> you know, like Lisitsky or here is Malevich went down. <coughs> here is Klutzis. No, here is Lisitsky. And, but that, of course, I understand. This is like objective condition of bit like uh, what avant-garde actually was opposing that because they wanted to victory over the sun they wanted to go against the gravity though he by this he artistically wants to intervene into how usually russian avant-garde and let's say black square is misinterpreted by uh, reducing it to a cultural reference, to be a mere sticker. So like you have a black square and you put somewhere, and that's the Malevich. No. In Malevich, it's not only black square, but it's also the white surrounding, the grayish white background. It was, it should, could, has to be understood as a movement so black square is, for Malevich, is not a black square, that square. Is not, an, is not representational. It's a movement, just a one, let's say, a one position of that movement. It's very cinematic. So these things move all the time. They were meant to move. But that was a limit of painting. That's why Malevich was crazy about film. There is a book called Malevich and Film by Margarita Tupitsin. And then Malevich made a film attempt. There is a scenario. It's published by with Hans, Hans Richter, 97. So film, you know, that's the thing. That paintings was because they had to paint, but the idea was so strong going outside of painting. 
These are very interesting things. And then he, uh, Ilya Orlov made a theat sort of theat theatrical some uh, play with those elements involved, like a gray cube, thin black line, black square, then a red square, little red star, all these elements that are fallen, they discuss. And they talk about Putin's Russia, they talk about the failure of the Russian avant-garde, or all these things. Immediately after his interview with Margarita Tupitsin, who is scholar of Russian avant-garde, and then uh, interview with uh, Kazimir Malevich. You know this artist who lives in New York, called Kazimir Malevich, who sent a letter to Art in America in 1988, pro protesting exactly. No, that time he was living in Belgrade. He's a conceptual artist. Uh, quite much exhibiting around. Uh, he is not only as a Kazimir Malevich, also he has a, a lot of work as Alfred Barr, Museum of uh, American Art, and also as Walter Benjamin. So there is interview with that Malevich. Then there is some intervention body you did during the NATO intervention in Yugoslavia. Translation that we initiated of Alberto Ijar Serrano. It is now, we made the ready of a book, a first <coughs> English language book about his writings. He lives in Mexico City and uh, he's old, but rather marginal or not known in Western English speaking world, neither in German. And uh, he was a person who introduced Althusser into Latin America. He is a person who was a member of many conceptual art groups, member of Zapatista movement. He uh, wrote a few books on Godard. So you have a person who is a militant in politics, in theory, but that and then involved in the populist movements, like Zapatista. Even there are rumors that he was subcomandante Marcos at some point, the one who was giving the statements. Like he was, he is one of the voices, and I'm sure it can be true. But he did not understood the art made in that struggles to be a simple art, to be only a activist art with just some morals or working with communities. No. His theory is that art, if you are into art, has certain requirements which are quite demanding and strong. And you have to follow to the end. So he's for very complicated art in the populist militant struggles. His writings are, as all his links, quite uh, complex. But we have translated a book, David Moore's translated a book, and uh, these and other publications of us is actually now in historical materialism conference in London. We're going to announce this tomorrow. It's like a few of the publications that if there is a time, I will present it. And uh, two poems by Raquel Dalton, uh, Latin American political poet. This is a fourth issue. I, I have to go very quickly. This, uh, this issue is dealing with history. And it's called remembering as future. Like how to remember certain things from the past, but not the way, so they're going to stay safely in the past. How not to just archive them but make a life, how to actualize certain moments. 
this was quite much about Finland. Then from Prague is Zbinek Baladran. Maybe you are familiar with his work. Uh, somebody from India, but living in Helsinki. Then we have all these uh, uh, section on Rancière, who deals very much with these uh, questions of past. Rabra was involved in organizing Rancière's visit to Helsinki. And uh, there is an interview I did especially about his Althusserian period, which he denied later <coughs> by writing the book called Althusser's Lesson. And about some, maybe uh, I have a bit a critical approach toward how Rancière's some theoretical tools are, uh, are not adequate to understand uh, a colossal, massive class struggles, like a revolution, for example, October Revolution. Rancière cannot explain October Revolution, but the thing is that he is not interested in that. Because what he intervened with this critique of identity, identification, and uh, how the labor processes has other registers of struggles, are quite, I think, interesting. And then uh, we published a text here that Rancière wrote in 76, but then was translated in 77 in one very obscure journal in Edinburgh called Edinburgh Film. And uh, I found that and uh, reprinted here. It is about Robert Kramer. American film director, this film called Milestones. It's about this post-68 depression, which Rancière criticized. That's the times of militant Rancière. Rancière was Maoist, as you know. But the, we continue to work with Rancière. Now it's coming next month, a book after reading third issue, Rancière gave to our collaborator, Ivana Momchilovic, a text for a rub rub that he wrote for Althusser, influenced by Althusser, in 1965, very early text. His first philosophical text, never published, neither in French and in English. It's about the dead wood. So Rancière's first text is called Dialectics between private interest and reason. It is very Althusserian, deals with Marx's interpretation of the dead wood. That was the story of the third issue. It is 20 something page. We already translated. He wrote a new introduction, and I think it's coming December. 10th, 15th of December, this book will be ready. There are some other comments, visual, textual comments. Small book, maybe 40 pages. Another text by uh, this Mexican militant, Alberto Ijar Serrano. Then here is uh, something, where did you disappear? Here, something that I am and here, very proud that we publish, is a two text by Roman Jakobson, linguist. These are translated from Czech. This is organized actually with transit, uh, not with transit, but uh, uh, with Havranek from transit supported this translation. Finding translator and fi financing it. So uh, Jakobson, while he was re re living in Prague, he lived many years in Prague, all 20s and until 38, until Nazis came. He was involved with avant-garde groups, futurists, surrealists, all of them. And he wrote uh, uh, story, like linguistic studies, like Prague linguistic circle is that. But he wrote the two texts which I read about in the interview with uh, his wife, Kristina Pomorska, who was also a linguist. No linguist, a literary theoretician. 
and uh, wrote excellent book on Russian formalism, for example, one of the first theoretical analysis. And uh, is it, is she mentions two texts. I said, by the way, Jakobson also wrote texts that are very experimental. He didn't only write about art, he wrote artistic texts. And one is, he discovered how Russian poets, futurists, including Hlebnikov, Mayakovsky, predicted the year of revolution that it will happen in 1917. Yes. And he wrote a text about how a poet predicted future with such accuracy. It's like a, a collection of these predictions. And he made another experimental text making the remix, really the remix as we understand today, of Alexander Herzen's a Russian revolutionary from the mid 19th century who wrote a book, Other Side of Shore. It's about how 1848, so 1848 revolution <coughs> happening in Europe was seen in Russia. Jakobson made a montage from that book, a text, and it sort of make a different narrative. It's very interesting. It didn't write anything. It's everything from that book. So like today, uh, DJs, you know, take peace and make something else. He made from one book a new text. And then we translated a text of Viktor Shkovsky. You know who is Viktor Shkovsky? Okay, so he wrote one science fiction book called uh, Iperit, Mustard Gas. And uh, it was uh, written by with this uh, Ivanov. Only intro we translate. It is uh, set in London in 2023. Uh, there is a main character is a, a black man who does not sleep and uh, works three shifts to collect the money for the South African Communist Party. And this is a London where there is no any more folks. It's like crazy. And it is connected with Istanbul. Uh, it is uh, one of Shklovsky's literature books. We also translate, this is only intro, the first time in English. Actually, even uh, one in, in committee discovered this book. It is Shklovsky book from 1926, Journey to the Land of Movies. He wrote for children. It's a children book. And with the beautiful illustrations of Dmitry Mitrokin. Uh, it is about a boy, Kolya, who escapes the Russian Revolution and goes to US with a boat somehow. And there is orphan like living in the streets. And the, seeing the, the, the brutal US, the brutal capitalism in the US. And he meets a uh, film. He goes into film business and meets a, a black boy his age who shows him around and meets Charlie Chaplin. It's about cinema. It's very interesting. It also explains, if you know Shkolsky's theory, uh, devices, techniques of filmmaking and so I'm leaving, I don't have much copies with me, but I can leave one. <laughs> and uh, then also we started now with this issue, it will follow. It's a, a section called demarcating free music. We want really to make uh, things uh, about that. Like musicians, talk to musicians and interview and then try to make an open that interview to something else with comments. One is with uh, Tony Conrad, who died. You know Tony Conrad, minimalist musician, who has an album also with Faust, with some of Velvet Underground. With, he was into this American avant-garde anyway and filmmaker, so an Australian did, and then Eddie Prevost. These are improvised musicians. And uh, our last uh, thing is that uh, we 
are having here the extensive dossier on collective called ARF ARF. We are RAB RAB meets ARF ARF. By the way, RAB RAB, I didn't tell what it is. It comes from Conrad Lorenz book. So has no intellectual some meaning. Has, but now we have another understand explanation. RAB RAB is uh, how Conrad Lorenz explains the voice when ducks are pairing they are showing the typical un animal behavior that they would incite violence. But a rub rub means calling to pairing. So this violence and love, two opposite things, rub rub. It's like this impossibilities, form politics, rub rub. Sound same, but not same. From there it comes. It's not, it's very Dadaistic. Yeah. And then uh, this issue also come in two volumes. <coughs> it's for me very quick now to tell about this one because it's only one topic. It's called In the Belly of the Beast, Art and Language, New York Project, 1972 and 1976. This was quite a work. Uh, it was uh, the, all this. You can have a look. I have this one. It's here. This is like a first volume. White one is a supplement. The, the thing there is what happened to art and language. Do you know art and language? Art, conceptual art group. OK, very conceptual. They did these indexes and stuff. but. In 73, something happened to them that they became radically politicized. They became politicized to such extent that in their texts they were referring to Mao Tse Tung. They were working with Maoist groups in New York, and it led to a, a moment of impossibility that dissolved New York section. So now what is with Mel Ramsden and Michael Baldwin, which is continuous Charles Harrison died, until today is UK art and language. So this is a very interesting moment to my understanding of conceptualism, political conceptualism, political art, because they were interested in how to index conversation, how to index what is happening inside their collective, and what are limits of artistic group of collective, but they went so deep to understand, to research themselves that at some point it was necessary to go outside. And that's the project called Blurting in New York. Blurting in New York was edited by Michael Corris. Michael Corris is a, was an artist and also a person who wrote a very interesting book on Ad Reinhardt and abstract expressionism, edited, to my knowledge, one of the best book on conceptual art, published by Cambridge University. But it's not academic nonsense, what usually these universities get out. It's really uh, a passionate, but very rigorous, very scholarly study of of conceptual art. So here I made very long interview with Michael Corris. This is uh, explaining all what they did and printing some stuff that are completely unavailable, like a workbook, fully reprinted here, reprint. These are a blurting of art and language, some other works. These are their uh, network diagrams. They were analyzing how much they are connected to each other, how their knowledge, previous knowledge, intellectual bagage is introduced to group, how it changed. They try to systematize everything. And then, then they started a new journal called Fox, the Fox. Then the Fox was also, not as rigor as uh, like art language journal and that 
was not even enough because that Maoist element already entered. They couldn't now go to gallery system. They started red herring and red herring end up as a main trend which became Stalinist journal in 1978 with Andrew Menard and that was dead, that finished. Like, so conceptualist, the, some of the most sophisticated conceptualists enter to politics and finding themselves in the laps of Stalinist. Can you imagine that? But that's what happened. So they disbanded everything. Some become, I ask to, we discuss here, became religious after. But Michael Collins is a person who work, went into union work. By the way, many art and language members were union activists. Uh, once in Canada, this Carl Beveridge, uh, Mel Ramsden in Australia, David Rushton in the north of UK, <coughs> Michael Corris in New York, a, a real union activism. And Michael Corris was so pleased by the outcome of this engagement <coughs> that he gave <coughs> for us to publish five uh, texts documents that is not available. Here is a transcript from 73. You can see that how they talk to each other. Then the chorus early text. And what is very interesting is this. When in 1976 in Venice, uh, art and language took part and the counter pamphlet was made by New York Art and Language. You have to understand that very big names were involved here, like Joseph Kossuth, for example. So like it is not some minor art students. It was really, a, it, it was not like a, this extremism didn't came from, from being young and student and crazy. It came from from the very practice what they were doing. So this very interesting text, it's criticizing that uh, Venice and... Uh, and then that's the politics, frontiers of underdevelopment. So this, and a very bitter mail of uh, Mel Ramsden to Art Forum. By the way, many of these texts this text, for example, was commissioned by, by Art Forum, but didn't publish, so they wrote this letter. It's interesting how in the 70s Art Forum and this kind of mainstream magazines were open to such a radical and militant statement. But of course, these things have changed. And uh, these are journals. This is all what we publish in four years. And we publish also a few books. This is what uh, I just talked to you about. Uh, then we published a, a book by, I don't have PDF, I'm sorry, but uh, a, a book that was designed by Slovenian uh, design collective called uh, Novi Collectivism. It, they are part of this NSK, Neue Slovenische Kunst. It is a work by Mina Henriksson, it is made by, uh, by the linocuts. These are linocuts, print with the paper, which also gives a bit of the linocut, you can check, feeling. Uh, it is a story of, uh, it is an analyze and a critique of Finland state's involvement in the business with the, with the South Af African apartheid regime. Finland was providing almost 80% of the paper to South Africa regime in 70s and 80s. Officially, state was boycotting. Look now. And Finland is known with, his, with their neutrality. But the businessmen, industrialists, and the paper industry is a big industry in Finland, were saying to state, you know, and they did the business. They sell. And what does it mean if you sell a paper to white apartheid fascists in South Africa? Which means 
There was no internet then. They were doing propaganda with that paper. And uh, she made a huge archival research to show on what time, on what date a real boycott started. So at some point, I don't remember now exactly, say, end of 70s, beginning 80s, then Finland really entered to a, a, a real boycott, which means they didn't send any more papers. But that happened only when the workers who were driving this big paper ballas, you know how it's the rounds, said that we're not going to drive these things to a bloody fascist regime. And all transport union decided to protest this business. So what does that mean? The, the message she wants to show, say, is that politics starts only when workers, when the people declare the boycott or whatever. When what states are talking, what parties are talking, means nothing, you know? It is like, means, of course, means, but uh, not the real politics is, is in, the, in the way when that a must subjectivity declares itself. And she also looks historically back how uh, paper industry was not only with working with apartheid regime, right wing, but also right wing before Second World War by extensively supporting the right wing regime in Finland and the anti-workerist, anti-union publications by giving them paper as much as they want. So that's the, uh, and then one small pamphlet also that's sold out. That one, unfortunately, I bring only one copy. But uh, because it was very expensive, this to produce this kind of book, it uh, it's costly. It's artist book, limited edition. But I leave one copy here. And another thing, what actually my plan was to talk today, which I am <laughs> now coming in the end, is this book. <laughs> is this book, you know? We it, have it, huh? No. I told you, it came out two hours ago, three hours ago. <laughs> Today, when we, uh, we were driving with the car with Florin, and I said, look, I received a message from the designer with the photos. It was late. Because it is printed in such a, I understand, you know, like designers work in, in complicated matters. So the design is also the, the like, content. And then it is like a <coughs> silk screen uh, with a blue panton on the, on the brown paper uh, with the flaps, with the inner picture. And when you print these thousand copies, of course, it doesn't come so quickly. But I can talk a little bit about this book. And I promise to Florin, I'm going to send you next week a box to Florin, which can promise will distribute to those who are interested. Uh, this book was quite a work. It is the first English language translation of a Russian formalist's writings on Lenin's language. Uh, it is, the content is this, maybe I. This, uh, who doesn't have? It is charging all the time. Yeah. If, you, if, okay. if it goes out from battery, this dies in a second. It works only with a, uh, no, no. I, it's, I manage with it so far, I don't know, <laughs> until then. Well, anyway, so the content is a translation of, of, uh, of this, uh, let me explain like this. Uh, in 1924, the magazine which Mayakovsky was editing with Ossip Brick, and they were like a left front of art, they called themselves. 
which was organized in 1923 to understand what are the role of avant-garde experimental art in the conditions of revolutionary Russia. And let's not forget, condition was quite difficult one, which then was introduced, NEP, New Economy Politics Policy. And the uh, new excitement of communism, all this stuff, and then the reality of the world, the reality of outside world. First of all, it was until 21, 22, civil war. From England, Germany, America, everybody sent the troops against to destroy the workers state, okay? It was that mess, and it comes to build the communist institutions or communist state in where? In the peasant, rural dominated country. So, then with, with the lack of industrial conditions, all these difficulties you know, and then 1923, in that conundrum, in that impossibility, Avant-gardists led by Mayakovsky started a journal called Lef, Left Front of Arts. And in 1924, in summer, that year, as you know, he died in January. Uh, they did a special issue called Jezik Lenina, Language of Lenin, Lenin's language, which is a sixth the most calibered formalists I wrote a text studying devices, techniques of Lenin's speech and language. Who are they? Viktor Shkovsky. Who is Viktor Shkovsky? The person who wrote on futurism, who wrote on avant-garde things, who wrote on film, made a scenario with Lev Kuleshov. Who are other? Tinyanov, Eichenbaum, who wrote also about Zaum, also about Klebnikov, also about very experimental writing and even thinking that by studying this experimental language we can understand how Pushkin, Gogol wrote. That was their thing, like, like because their idea and the idea of avant-garde was what is the real constituent of the poetry, our words. What are the constituents, what makes words are sounds. So they study sounds. They wanted to get away from that interpretations of poeticness, poeticality or whatever, poetics of words as symbolists were doing, which is like having this picturesque, pictorial metaphors. They wanted to go to the very material core and they thought it is a sound, sound which comes. And all these things with sosir, signified, signifier, it's all sound concept. Like you say word, it's that sound and that what is here, okay? But what makes sound? What is sound made? How is sound? What is the material constituency of sound? Is movement, rhythm, nothing else. So what they did study, they studied the rhythm. And they were looking, even earlier also, symbolists made, let's say, steps in there. How are the rhythms, how consonants are repeated in the uh, poems? And how we happen to like or not like certain poems because of their rhythm, because of their phonetic rhythm. So these studies led them to look at other segments of language, of speech. And in 1924, they looked at Lenin way of speaking. A very interesting text. I have to tell you, like, these are really the one of maybe most interesting political formalist texts of 20th century. Because Lenin, I don't know how much you are familiar with Lenin's work, biography. Lenin was nobody prior to revolution. The general culture, the intellectuals didn't know even who is Lenin. They knew Trotsky, they knew Lunacharsky, Bogdanov definitely, but Lenin was 
one extremist, Bolshevik. And he came with that April thesis, with that state and the revolution and writing with such a language, using such a concept, bringing words in such a way that they were astonished. Where are these people coming from? As if they emerged from some underground, which they did. And they, they, they you know, they are, their excitement with Lenin's language was that this language is completely detached from the mainstream existing bourgeois narrative. Don't forget one more thing. Lenin and Bolsheviks were only political. There were other individuals with such a strong position were against what? War. First World War, when happened from 1914 to 1918, many leftists, all European leftists, what is called Second International, supported war. And Lenin broke, broke up with all. For him, war was nothing else but capitalism, but a murder in the worst form. It was, war was the most unacceptable thing. And anybody who even wrote a little bit, but we have to defend our, you know, little Poland, our little Romania, our whatever, in first for them, and if you, he or she was leftist, was out. So, of course, there was Rosa Luxemburg definitely against many others, and that's why she broke for, from Second International, and that's why she was <coughs> killed. She was killed by the Socialist Democrats. You know, anyway. So that thing prompted these people who know the language to understand how that language happened, how that speech, writing, relationship to words happened that it's so much not part of the state, so much not part of the bourgeois, because the principle of futurism and avant-garde was what? Demolition of bourgeois culture. Bourgeoisie was Philistine, outmoded, corrupted. Read any manifesto you like of futurism was against bourgeoisie. And then comes the people who are, they are really against bourgeoisie. And then the way how they write also about the culture. And they are not just a primitive, like, impulsively against, but making back, he wrote on Hegel, wrote on like Tolstoy, has like very like understanding that different culture of non-bourgeois culture, something as a future project, as a, not as a bohemian impulsive reaction. No, it's like big theory. So they set up to research and, of course, they find funny stuff. They find such a interesting quotations like Tinyanov has such a Lenin, his quotations, you only read the quotations he selects from Lenin, it's enough. But also the theory they made out of it is quite, uh, I think, even strong today. And uh, most of the texts they analyze of Lenin are not some old text, <coughs> but our text written after the revolution or during, until the time they wrote these things, until he died. Everyone refers to Lenin's last text, better few, but better. Everyone refers to Lenin's anti-military texts. Everyone refers to Lenin's text where he criticized national pride. And these are, you can see there, what make this formalist text today also actual. They did not relate to Lenin's language as a dead Latin word, but as a, as a word of dead times, which they didn't know what to do. Simple thing I will tell you, because many things about Lenin, Lenin is, in order to arrive to let Lenin, I tell you one thing. You have to maybe throw 
5,000 books to rubbish and take like, I, because there is so much, especially from after the, during the Cold War, war, war written about Lenin in such a, I would say, non-scholarly way, such a pathetic anti-communist way, that this, this like, uh, what actually was happening there, you can never arrive there. Fact is that Lenin's last three texts that he wrote during the new economy politics were postponed to be published by Pravda. There is no such a thing that Lenin was boss. Because they were into entering into that contradiction of what is the definition of state. Lenin's book, State and Revolution, is defending withering away of state. This is anarchist uh, thesis, argument. And uh, so these are texts that deal with contemporary issues and then they ask what is contemporary in language, what is conjuncture, what is actual. And uh, other issues when you read this text that you can discover is how Lenin used citations. How uh, he, he, he incorporates the other words into, into his speech, into his language. You know what, this is like uh, what structuralists would do. There is, no su there is no such a model, but there are, let's say, uh, proposals of what could be that model, like deflation, all this citation they have, uh, especially Eichenbaum and uh, Tignano. But mostly it is not a model, again, that would make it as a, a ready, ready model of how a revolutionary speech should be. Very much. It's all about that. Yeah, but is there, is there, I don't know, some... Um, <coughs> formulas. Uh, yeah, some formulas, some, um, yeah. Yes, there is. Like there is a pl lot, a lot. I can bomb as a formula, same, uh, this uh, Tomaszewski. And then interesting thing is that year later, uh, Alexei Krushenik, he was a futurist. He's a poet who in, invented a word called Zaun, beyond sense. He read this special issue and came with a book called 11 Oratorial Devices of Lenin's Speech. Used Kutsis images. And uh, there he claims that if futu formalist has managed to penetrate into Lenin's language, the deep soul, it's partly to do of my invention of Zaun. So from me came a Zaun, which they look at the Lenin, and now I look at the Lenin, you know, like making the circle. It's a very, this text is quite referring to a formalist studies and uh, proposing what are that devices of, of this. Uh, he proposed actually the model. He, despite of being avant-garde artist, is the more academically written, more this kind of, I would say, compact, closed writing than the others. Others are very open texts with total questions, mm -hmm. unresolved uh, readings and things like that. A book I wrote a very extensive introduction, especially because I felt that the modern readers, contemporary readers, or those who are in art, are it's difficult to get that picture of Lenin. Whereas there is a fog in art history, like I criticize a lot of art historians here. Most of them published in October, Journal October from Benjamin Buchloch to, I don't know, Christina Kier, and then Boris Groys. I used the opportunity to 
study how Boris Groys actually misinterprets that politics of Russian avant-garde being Stalinist. And, uh, and I develop a theory of, uh, of conjuncter, which means of today. So the real forms emerge when you deal with your conjuncter, actual situation. And uh, afterward is written by Darko Suvin, theoretician. He published quite a lot of things on Russian formalist, old Yugoslavian scholar. And he wrote a text that is called In the Shadow of Never-Ending Warfare. So it's uh, about, uh, he compares <coughs> Lenin and Shkovsky, and especially puts a focus on that concept of war, military industry, and, and how is today. Because today, where we live, we live in the, the worst scenario that exists from the beginning of the 20th century of how everyday life, politic, globalist, politics, economies, militarized. Now, economy today man, means nothing but like a, but a war. The most strong companies in the world, from Bechtel, which was the CIS company, to Lockheed, are companies that Boeing, that build uh, military weapons. It's a huge, it's crazy. This, today it became probably the, the peak. You can see now, you follow the news with Khashoggi, this uh, journalist that is murdered, like a reaction of the politicians in Sweden, in UK, in Germany, in US, Trump and all, is that we cannot do nothing to Arab Emirates because we have 60 billion arm deal. Like, it's, became today even the worst than ever. And that's why the big part of my introduction and the afterward tries to actualize the questions that formalists put in 20s and avant-garde from that anti-militarist position. Let's say like defending peace. Very simple, but it's difficult, you know. So this is the book, unfortunately, couldn't arrive to Bucharest, you know, but it's somewhere in Tallinn. And uh, we have some few other books that are coming out. Serrano, I mentioned, we make a book with uh, on uh, free jazz music on Archie Shep and Bill Dixon. Uh, a few other things, yeah. Actually, until May, we are uh, preparing now uh, seven new books will come out. Similar topics. So yeah, this is general project. Do you have any questions or do you want to know something more? Are they online, did you say? This is not online. No, this one I'm assuming not, but the, the magazine. Yeah, first issue, second, third is online. Can download PDF. And uh, do you have some like a uh, uh, suggestion of of uh, or if you have not maybe now immediately of contribution of an idea of some other contribution of collaboration? We are really open. We are very not we are non institutional sort of, we don't have an institution, but we try to make things possible. Like, for example, this book costs because the translation costs. We had a good translator. Thomas Campbell translated proofreading, you know, it's like, this is first time in English, by the way. And that is also another thing. All these writers, if you are, it seems you are familiar with Russian formalists. Many things are translated in English, quite a lot. But none of these uh, Lenin uh, like, uh, writings in no other languages except Eastern German translation 1970, 
published in Leipzig. No English, no Italian, no French, no even Serbo-Croatian, no Bulgarian, Polish. That's interesting. And why is that? And many who wrote about these texts, there are many scholars on Russian photorism, they said, this day does not uh, worth to spend time. These are propaganda. Because, you know, 50s, 60s, Lenin was automatically Stalin, and Stalin was automatically Hitler. So mm -hmm. that was the thing. And unfortunately, still in some circles, it's like what? Lenin, Stalin, Hitler. <laughs> so, you know, then why to deal with that? Well, was it like that? Question is that. So, if you have some comments, suggestions, please write or we have like web website. What's the next issue about? Next issue is uh, it's about a lot, it will be a lot about film. This is not a special topic. Mm, already uh, there is text by Rene Green, artist. Then there is this uh, dossier on uh, structuralist feminist filmmakers, their statements, interviews. Translation of Robert Linhart. This uh, French activist, militant theoretician. Well, let me think. Then Yehuda Safran, something about Simone Weil and Godard. Uh, there will be a very extensive text on, on Shkolsky's book about love. Actually, we have a few texts about love in next issue. Sort of love as a in form of inquiry and things like that. And uh, against war, few things. Interview with Peter Holworth interview with some uh, other scholars like uh, Rastko Mochnik. <laughs> okay. So I think we are done, huh? Thanks.